in this talk that I that I sometimes give, I have a slide that that says the app was born of naive optimism and lack of skill. Hello and welcome to Hack Attack. My name is Jakob Hack. Spell with a K. I'm your host, and you're watching a um, Hack Attack doc tutorial. difference between a regular Hack Attack episode and a Hack Attack docutorial is that not only does this video contain the regular stuff such as sound demos, whatever this is, face cam bits, uh, also tutorial bits, well a docutorial also contains bits and pieces of developer interviews. And this time I've had the privilege of actually interviewing Chris Carlson, the creator of Borderlands Granular. And so before we get into anything, I'm going to let Chris introduce himself. I'm Chris Carlson. In my day job, I work as a developer, basically. I think my title there is like senior technologist or something. It's very general. In practice, what I do is I work with code and sound, and I'm often developing uh, interactive exhibits for museums and for brands, um, and that can sometimes look like developing graphics-based applications, multi-touch things, things that use your body in space, you know, like with the Kinect, but also doing things with interactive sound and generative audio. And I also do a little bit of, of design work, especially within Borderlands. I'm not a trained graphic designer, but I think very hard about the design that goes into the app and how things look and feel. All right, so we're going to look at the new features inside Borderlands Grinder, such as uh, the new Tempo Sync mode. There's even Ableton Link in there now. Uh, there's an envelope mode. There's even a new effect. There's loads of stuff that Chris has done with this update for Borderlands Grinder. But first, I'll throw in my feature splash screen as I normally do. I make this screen for you viewers so that you can easily have an overlook at what type of features an app might support or might not support. And in this case, I think there's something that a lot of people will, blah, blah, blah. I think there's something that a lot of people, a lot of users will react to. And it is the fact that this version does not come out with support for audio unit extensions. And so before you cry yourselves to sleep, like I almost did, because of course I was also hoping for audio unit support, I did ask Chris about this. And uh, well, this is what I said. AUV3 seems pretty critical and seems like an, an immediate next step within the iOS realm. And so I'll definitely be looking into that to try to figure out if it's possible. The one thing that I have like maybe a small concern about is the user interface and dealing with a smaller window, how, how the graphics are gonna run there, what is involved in that. The other next step that I didn't mention before is that the app will run on iPhone. It is not in the store for iPhone and it won't be yet, but it is capable of running on an iPhone because I have tested it on an iPhone 5. So I'm motivated to get this thing on the iPhone as a universal app. Um, and in the process of doing that, I know I'm going to have to think through the menus, um, making some some modal views that sort of sit on top of things um, just to deal with that smaller form factor. And so when I look at an iPhone 5 and I look at an AUV3 plug-in box, I see a similar layout challenge. And so I think I'll probably be dealing with a lot of those issues as I push towards the iPhone. And so then it's a matter of basically translating that to the AUV3 layout and the architecture. So short answer is I hope so. I have no idea if it's possible. It has to be possible.
my colors match. The first feature we're gonna look at is the tempo sync feature. Because now with the tempo sync feature, you are actually able to do sequencer-esque type stuff if you wish to. It kind of goes against what Borderlands Granular probably means to a lot of people and even to myself, but the fact that you can now do it, I just want to show you that it can be done, all right? So in order to activate this feature, we just need to double tap on a grain cloud to select it and this menu will pop down. Now, if we look closely here, there are four new features in this list right here. And the one that we need is the one looking like a metronome. This is the tempo sync feature. Now, one thing to keep in mind before you activate the tempo sync is how many voices do you want playing in there? I'm going to set my voice to one because I'm going to create a four on the floor beat with a kick drum. Next, I'm going to activate the sync mode. Now, as I said, I want to create a four on the floor beat. So the beat offset needs to be set to beat. And then we use the division to set this one grain to play at a rate of one fourth. Now, when I play it, you'll hear that it doesn't really sound like a four on the floor beat. Okay, so the reason to why it doesn't sound like a four on the floor beat is because we are not using the right types of playback modes. You see, there are eight features inside the grain cloud menu that controls this. With these three features here, you can set how a sample will play back regarding its direction. Now, the next five controls, you can actually look at them as envelope settings. There's one more thing we need to do. If we want it to play a consistent kick, then we need to limit the sampling area for the grains. And we can do that with this control here. I really like this new tempo feature. And remember, it can be synced to Ableton Link. And you find the Ableton Link on off switch if you go through the global menu, tap the cogwheel icon, and it's right there. Now, if you don't want to sync to Ableton Link, then you can, of course, manually input your own BPM. And you do that right here. And this also supports tap tempo. I don't know about you, but I think we need more grain clouds because a four on the floor beat is boring on its own. So we could just make a new grain cloud by double tapping here on the screen, but we're not gonna do that. I wanna copy all of the settings I already have on this one. And the only thing you need to do in order to do that is to make sure that it is selected. As long as you've got a grain cloud selected, when you double tap on a screen to make a new grain cloud, it will copy the settings from the selected grain cloud. And there we go. So this one plays the same patterns as this one. And so what we can do now is fiddle around with all the beat divisions and everything here. But what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna offset the sync.
Now there is one more new feature called probability and you can find it right there and it's not that it's directly tied to the tempo sync mode it will always be there whether you've got your grain cloud synced to a tempo or not but what i wanted to highlight is how interesting it gets when you're using those modes together if I, for instance, set the probability to 85, then there will be an 85% chance that each grain will actually sample a sound. Would you agree with me if I said that Borderlands Granular is visually pleasing to look at? I have of course been wondering about the design choices behind this look and the, the responses I got from Chris was actually something I didn't expect. It kind of shattered my own ideas about how this came to be. When I started developing this, I knew very little about how to program graphics. And so the look and feel was necessarily simplistic and minimal. It's circles and rectangles. Those are called primitives in graphics programming. They're the most basic shapes you can create. In this talk that I, that I sometimes give, I have a slide that, that says the app was born of naive optimism and lack of skill. I didn't know what I was doing. I was trying to figure it out as I went. And so the design of this was born of all these constraints. And it still is. I, I am not a pro uh, iOS developer. I'm always having to look up, you know, how the hell do I fade this button the right way that I want to fade it in, in Objective-C or, you know, like, how do you deal with a table view to make a, a, a browser or whatever? You know, you see artists constantly talking about this in interviews that they impose constraints on themselves. Here, I didn't impose these on themselves. It was just, I didn't know what I was doing. And so I had to, follow something that was simple. And so within the constraint of only being able to do this limited set of stuff with graphics programming and with audio programming, the aesthetic of the app was, was created. And when you see the screenshots for the desktop version, it's even clearer, you know, the, the genesis of those shapes and, and color schemes, um, which are still present. The next thing I want to show you is the new envelope mode. So to access the envelope mode, we just have to double tap on a grain cloud so that the menu pops down. And then right there at the end, we can see a button that has an envelope shape in it. So it's kind of hard to miss. So once we activate this, we can see envelope controls popping up around the grain cloud. And this works like a regular amplitude envelope that you'll find in most synthesizers. So you have your attack, decay, sustain, and release. And what's really nice about it is that the attack gives us up to half a minute of attack time and the release a minute of attack time, 60 seconds of release, which makes sense for something like Borderlands Granular. But if we look even closer, right beneath the envelope button, there is another button where it says one and two. And here we can actually switch between the envelope controls and the grain cloud controls. So 
So with this envelope, we can now make little triggers that we can move around over our sounds and just have them trigger whenever we want, instead of having them looping forever, like normal grain clouds do. You know, apart from rectangles and circles, as Chris put it, there is more to the user interface than just the way it looks. The way it handles, the way it hides, the way menus, the way the menus doesn't have any names tied to them. I mean, there's a philosophy there. And so, of course, I asked Chris about that. And there's this one thing that he says towards the end of his response that is, I just find it very inspiring. One of the design principles of the app is uh, visual feedback. I view that as important for increasing the sense of actually touching these objects and touching the sounds. So when you touch a sound, it, the, the border fades in, so you know which one you're touching. The little plot in the middle of the grain cloud, uh, that was added to give you some sense of which cloud is making which sound at a given time and how loud the sound is because the visual representation clips to a box when it gets towards the max amplitude. This notion of having this broad open canvas where all that is emphasized is the interaction, the sounds and the, the grain clouds. Those are the, the most important elements of this thing. All the menus and buttons can be hidden and that is intentional. I mean, it, it's starting to get a little bit more uh, menu divey as more features get added on just out of necessity because you know there's only so much space on the borders of the screen. But uh, my goal has always been to keep it as minimal in terms of navigational hierarchy and as open of an interface as possible. But the fundamental interaction is just touch and drag. For a while, I've sort of resisted creating any sort of manual for the app and going too deep on providing additional information. I'm at the tipping point now where things are getting complex enough that I want to help people learn how to use some of the more nuanced features of the app. but. I like the notion of like leaving it up to the user to explore and develop their own voice as something rather than sort of prescribing it to them. Now the next new feature I want to talk about is the new semi-tone pitch mode. And I want to tie this back to the envelope mode. You see, with the envelope mode, we can build a little mini keyboard of sorts. So let's say we have audio material, which is of the melodic type sort. We have a grain cloud and using the method I showed you earlier, we are copying this grain cloud to make two more new grain clouds. So now we have three grain clouds with the same settings and they all have the envelope mode activated. So the only thing we need to do now is to change the pitch between them. And back in the day, this used to be kind of hard because this pitch control leaves a lot to be desired. Well, it gets easier now that Chris have put in the new semi-tone pitch mode in there. And we can find that to the left of the envelope mode. So when we activate it, the pitch control turns into a semi-tone pitch control. And now it's very easy to pitch your stuff just the way you want. And you can pitch it 36 semitones down and 36 semitones up. To simplify, three octaves down and three octaves up. I'm always curious to find out how a person ends up becoming a developer.
I've always played music. Growing up, I played guitar and uh, piano, and I became more interested in things like effects pedals, especially once I got into guitar. And one of the first experiences I had was with like the little Boss DD5 delay pedal, which when you, you crank the feedback knob and the delay time knob, it like munges up the sound. Um, and I had never heard anything quite like that before. This was when I was in like ninth or 10th grade or something. As I got older, I got interested in, um, you know, making music on the computer. I, you know, eventually came to Ableton Live and started using that. And one of the things about Ableton that I loved was the fact that it was so flexible with how you treat audio. So you can just drop any number of effects on a track and completely change the sound from what it was originally. That interest, which I've been mainly pursuing in my spare time, wasn't my main work at the time. I, you know, I studied um, physics in my undergraduate degree, and so came out of that. Didn't really know what I wanted to do. I realized I didn't want to do um, a PhD in physics because that was way too intense and just didn't match my interests. And so I kept pursuing this music and computers thing, and I started to become aware of creative coding. And I had a friend who. Um, was doing a music degree at the time, and he took a computer music class where they showed him Maximus P, and he's like, Chris, you gotta check this thing out. And so that sort of showed me there was this world that I hadn't quite tapped into yet. And eventually I ended up going to graduate school at this place called the Center for Computer Research and Music and Acoustics. So I ended up going to this program, and I came into it with this desire to build new musical interfaces. Automation. It's a very powerful tool within Borderlands Granular and it allows you to automate basically everything. Now you've been able to record and automate the movement of the grain clouds themselves for quite some time. But there's something that Chris has added that makes this even more interesting now. Because now you can even automate resizing and movement of audio files. Now, if you're an existing user of Borderlands Granular, then you most likely already know how to start automating things. But if you're new, then in the upper right corner here, you have a little icon. And when you tap that once, you get another menu popping up. Now, this is a global menu and there are more controls in here, but I'm not going to go through them now. Um, one thing I can highlight, though, is that if you press the cogwheel icon here, you get into the settings menu and right up there, there's an I. When you press that, you actually get a list of all of the icons inside the app and descriptions of what they do. So you can easily find out what all of these other controls do by checking it up in here. I want to show you the automation uh, start stop button and it's right there. Now there's one more thing I want to highlight about the automation upgrade and it is the way that you can still see your automation going on in the background while you've got your grain cloud selected. So this grain cloud is automated right now so it's moving around. Once I double tap it, the outer ring with all of its menu items will stay still while this little ring here with all of the grains in it will still move around and so it's actually showing us the automation we did. I really like this. You know, I've always been really curious about the origins of Borderlands Granular. How does one even get the idea of making something like this in the first place? Well, of course, I asked Chris, and this is what he said. One of the classes I took along the way was uh, this class, um, I can't remember the exact name, but it was basically learning C++ and using it to make audio devices. Uh, and the final project for that class was you had to make an instrument and do a performance with it. 
The first version of Borderlands is this desktop app. Everything's done with keyboard shortcuts in the mouse. You move your mouse to where you want to put a grain cloud and you hit the G key and it generates this little grain cloud. You can click on it and drag it around. All the waveforms appear as these uh, flat 2D shapes that they can only go sideways or up. You just toggle the position with a, a keystroke. And then all the parameters are just edited by you know, a keyboard shortcut and you enter the numbers. And that was it. You loaded all the sounds from a single directory. It would just load in on startup. There was no menu. There were no buttons or anything. It was just, just the grain clouds and the sounds. And that engine that drives that uh, is still present in the current app, essentially. It's been expanded. But the original process of just grabbing these grains from files and sampling them is still at the core, at the heart of this app. So while I was sitting here working with my video, I've been working with it for months now and I really, really want to finish it. Well, Chris contacted me and says he's added another feature into the mix. And lucky for me, I hadn't begun recording the actual screenshotted material or video material yet. I had been working with the scripting and the narration and I had been working with the app making music and demos for this video. So I was really happy that he contacted me before I actually started recording the material because if I had done that, that means that I would have recorded material where this new feature would have been missing. And that wouldn't have been fun because this video is supposed to go out on the same day that Chris releases this update. So to make a long story short, well, the new feature that Chris put in there, well, it's a ring modulation mode and you can find it right there. One thing I did ask Chris about is why he chose to work with granular synthesis, because it's a very specific form of synthesis. I mean, it's basically sampling. I wanted it to be an interface for granular synthesis where you could perform with granular synthesis in a more gestural way. That's kind of where the, the idea landed. It started by me sort of looking at existing granular synthesis interfaces and thinking like, okay, most of these have just banks of knobs and sliders. What if I could make something with OpenGL, which is basically an API for programming graphics within C++. I knew about granular synthesis because I had a copy of Curtis Rhodes' book on uh, granular synthesis. And in the course of my development in making my own music, I found that I really preferred sampling music because of the fact that you could get so many organic, natural sounds from recordings that then can be totally transformed into something really synthetic, but there's already this built-in character that you have accessible in, in real-world sounds. Well, I like to think of it as like, like a sonic microscope in a way with granular synthesis, where you are using these grain clouds to zero in on little interstitial moments that are kind of embedded in between transients and in these audio files that you're playing with. Being able to zoom in on something and then sustain it infinitely is something that really excites me. Um, so finding sounds within sounds. Now there are some other smaller things I want to highlight, like how there's always been a vibrato in there. Why would I want to highlight that? Well, there's always been a vibrato amount, but you've never been able to set the frequency of it. And now you can do that. Actually, I think it's the other way around. You've always been able to set the, f you know, it doesn't really matter because you can do both now. However, since Chris has also introduced a new effect, namely the uh, ring modulation effect, well, every time you turn on the ring modulation effect, you're switching between the vibrato controls and the ring modulation controls. So it's not like you're choosing to use one over the other. Both effects are always active. You're just switching between the controls. 
Now there is this part of the interview I did with Chris that I really want to include here because he talks about other apps and, and developers that inspires him. Yeah, well, I mean, Sampler is an obvious choice there. I, I, Marcos and I uh, met actually back at Sonar um, when I was there, so he's great. Um, and I have a lot of respect for the stuff he makes. Elastic Drums is fantastic very clearly states what it, its intention is and, and its design. And I think that um, Oliver, the, the developer there, I think we probably share a similar desire to see like emergent complexity from the things we create. Uh, Alexander Randon's stuff, Pute Machine, beautiful. His design is so well thought through and it does this this thing so well. Oh, and, and then uh, Jonathan Liliadal goes without saying, um, is a foundational iOS tool. There's an amazing professionalism that comes through in the design of that app and in the, the, the attention to detail. And also Michael Tyson's work with AudioBus and, uh, and actually the um, engine, the amazing audio engine. I use that uh, as kind of the core architecture that surrounds all of the grain making code just to, to set up all the stuff with Core Audio. So. And I have a lot of admiration for those guys in the way that they are not only pushing these great updates to their code and developing these things that are so clearly stake out um, a particular area of music making, but the design, the marketing that they put into it. It's a lot of work and, um, and they're, they're very good at it. It has now been seven years since the first version of Borderlands Granular came out. And a lot of us who have been using BG, we've all been wondering the same thing. Why does it take Chris so long to put out updates? Because during these seven years, there's only been two updates. The first version of BG came out in 2012, first update was back in 2015, and the second update happened now in 2020. So I asked Chris about this and he gave me a very detailed and thorough answer, but I can't put all of it into the video. It would make it too long. However, I can shorten it down. So you have to remember that Chris has a main job that takes up most of his time and it does not involve iOS app development. He's basically been working on BG during his spare time. On top of this, he and his wife has had three kids during this time and they've also moved their home twice across America. On top of that, Chris cares a lot about the end user and he didn't want to put out smaller updates. He of course wanted to fix some of the issues but also add more substantial stuff and new features with each update. A lot of us started thinking that the app would become abandoned but we were so wrong and I certainly can't wait until we get that iPhone update and of course also the AUE3 update. Let's just hope it takes uh, less time than five years or even three. Now there's actually a list of more stuff that Chris has done with this update and stuff that he's put in here and I can't talk about them all. But what I do want to mention are two things. Now the thing I want to talk about has to do with the input recording. You see you can record stuff right into Borderlands Granular. Well there's this new waterfall mode that streams the audio from the left to the right. So if you've got Borderlands Granular for instance loaded into an input FX slot in something like AudioBus through IAA it's now easy to use Borderlands Granular as a granular effect which is pretty cool. And the second thing I want to show you has to do with the automation speed. You see, you can now slow down and speed up the automation speed with a control that can be found in global menu, go to the cogwheel menu and right down there. And this is awesome. Chris has done a real bang up job with this update and I'm really grateful that he keeps on working on it because Borderlands Granular is one of those, you know, it's just a brilliant app. It changed the way I uh, think about my music making. It changed the way I work. And yeah, it's changed many things for me. And I'm sure that there are a lot of users out there that could say the same thing. 
I want to thank you so much for watching. And if you found this video helpful, if you want to see more of it, if you want to support the work I do and the huge amount of time that I invest into my videos and my content, if you want to support that, then hitting the like button is really, really helpful. And also commenting down below. If you do like Borderlands Granular, tell us why. If you don't like it, tell us why. So um, that's about it. If you want to support me in any other way, then you have this link collection over here and uh, you can find my music over here. And this year, 2020, I'm going to try to make a new album. I can't remember exactly when I made the last one. I think it's not more than one and a half year or two years or one year. I can't remember exactly, but if I can't remember, it's probably been too long. So I need to do something about it. So I'm going to do something about it. Right. So as usual, I wish you a very productive week. Now go finger all of your stuff and have a lot of fun doing it. Thank you.